Okay, I'd like to start by thanking Greg, um, Darlene, and Jack Baker for the invitation to come speak. It's a, truly an honor to be able to speak um, this in this particular lecture circumstance. And I'd also like to thank Raquel for her support, if she's around still. Uh, she, she's made this um, quite easy. Traveling is not always the best. And before I start, I want to point out, for those of you who have not thought a lot about earthquake early warning, how many of you have thought a lot about it? Okay, not a lot. A few, a few. Good, good, good. Okay. So it's, it's, it's been a hot topic in California, so I would think that some of you have thought about it some. Okay, so you can see here, this is a seismogram from the Nisqually earthquake in Seattle, which is the most recent sort of notable earthquake that we've had there. And what you can see is the front part of this waves here. These are, um, what are the P waves or the pressure waves? So they, they come in advance and somebody who's technical in the audience can correct me if I get this wrong. <laughs> they come in advance of the shear waves, which is all the shaking. And so with the P waves, you can actually alert people in advance of the major shaking about what's going on because they precede it. And depending on the distance from the epicenter and that kind of thing, you may have anywhere from a few seconds up to a, a few minutes of warning. And in the case of a subduction zone in Washington State, this could be quite a few minutes. You might get five minutes of warning, for example, out of it, which is a long time. So. The question is what to do about this and what to think about it and, and how we can develop earthquake early alerts and warnings. And I'm going to start with a motivating uh, setup here, which are Greg's question, not Greg Dyerline, but Greg Barroza, um, who asked me um, before the SCEC meeting, he said, well, earthquake early warning is something that earth sciences can provide, but a lot of us are nervous about how the public and policymakers will perceive its uh, capabilities and limitations. And he's not alone. I've talked to quite a few people since, and I get the same questions over and over again. Um, so the first question is, will they be disillusioned if they get no warning? And what do you suppose the answer is? Yes, yes of course. And the second question is, what if there is a false alarm? Is that going to bother them? Yes, I heard somebody talk about this at lunch today, false alarms in Mexico. Um, it's a problem. What about a failure to alert? Well, that's similar. And finally, will earthquake early warning reduce the public's motivation to otherwise prepare for earthquakes? And what do you suppose the answer might be to this? Yes, potentially. So we're done. That's a, <laughs> that's a, well, there's a lot of yeses there. Um, so there aren't any easy solutions to any of these questions. And some of them we still have a lot to learn about. So I'm going to start then by showing you, uh, for those of you who have not seen it, the um, an example of the earthquake early uh, warning system that's set up here in California in, by Richard Allen's group, I believe. And let's see if I can get this thing to work. Whoops, that didn't work. Hmm. Earthquake, no shaking expected in 19 seconds. Earthquake, no shaking expected in 12 seconds. Earthquake, no shaking expected in 5 seconds. Okay, that's it. So, what do you think? So, I have a particular aim with this talk, and it's to change your perspective on this display. Um, and Richard Allen actually offered an apology when he gave me the link to this. And he said, well, I use this. He says, I've got my system set very, to a very low threshold, so I get alerted for everything. So, this is clearly a case where um, you would probably set the system parameters so that not everybody would get this kind of a warning. Um, but nevertheless, it illustrates the general layout for the earthquake um, a warning and what it would look like. And there's a lot of stuff going on. So what I'm going to provide in this talk is a risk interpretation and action framework or perspective on earthquake early warnings. And um, I would like, as I said, to change your perspective on that warning and bring to bear what judgment, decision making, and risk communication research can tell us about how people might interpret and use earthquake early warnings and how we might improve them to, um, to take advantage of that. So I'm going to start by putting early warnings into the context of a general framework for warnings. And I'm going to use one from tsunami warning and preparedness. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the role of risk assessment and partnerships there. And then I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on the last five bullets here, which are from the appraisal and action framework. I'll start by looking at the question of false alarms. They're also by analogy with another risk. And then talk about appraisal processes and then the roles of affect, cognition, and risk perception in understanding earthquake early alerts. So this um, 
and then implications. So this is uh, from a National Academies report that came out in 2011 on tsunami preparedness in the United States. And um, this general framework was developed by Nate Wood, who's with USGS, and Dennis Maletti, who some of you might know, who's very well known for his research in disaster and risk communication. And um, they worked with the rest of the committee to put this together. Um, you can't, we probably can't see the details, um, so if you're interested, I would suggest you go online and look at the report. Um, but you can see that there's five steps here, risk assessment, public education, threat detection, warning management, and public response. And um, the, there are a couple main points about this diagram that I'd like you to see. The first is that public education, uh, in order to understand what your needs are for public education and engagement, you need to have risk assessment. So risk assessment is a critical first step to figure out what is at risk and what kinds of um, vulnerabilities there are. Further, these together determine the needs for threat detection. So if you have a technical threat detection, de detection system, um, what it needs to accomplish and what it can do are a function of these. Um, then these, these, this input can be used in a warning management system so that you can issue alerts and warnings and then hopefully come out with a public response that makes sense, that actually improves people's risk situation. But you'll see that there's not only this formal inform and alert process, there are also informal mechanisms by which people um, receive information about risks, in this case tsunamis, but this would hold, hold for any earthquake situation as well, where people can access the technical de detection systems directly um, and, or indirectly uh, through social media, for example. So you get people sign subscribing to earthquake um, alert systems and themselves, and they're not going to get the formal warning, they're going to get some sort of detection information themselves. So the system's quite dynamic, and it's not going to be constrained by the formal warning system that you've developed. And that system then needs to take into account these other mechanisms. People also can get um, environmental cues about risks. And so um, in particular, in the case of multiple earthquakes, you get aftershocks. It, they're going to take cues from the preceding earthquakes and that kind of thing. So that's actually a particular problem with earthquakes. And they found that in, in uh, New Zealand, that people didn't expect there to be so many aftershocks. And these swarms, in particular, cause problems. So the system's pretty complex, and early warnings are only a small part of it. So risk assessments. Well, what about risk assessments as this first step? Well, one problem that we found with risk assessments is that they often don't exist. And um, in some work that we did in a survey of North American seaport chief engineers, we asked how often are seismic vulnerability assessments conducted for your port facilities and components. And um, this graph shows the results. So we had a pretty good response rate, it was over half, but that's still a total of about 60-some um, chief port en engineers. And uh, in the response options, there's anything from there are no plans to conduct seismic vulnerability assessments up to they're conducted on a regular basis every one to three years. Um, and we, I have these in blue and yellow. So we um, color-coded the responses so that they could answer anonymously, but we could tell whether they were in um, which kind of seismic zone they were in. So we could tell if it was a low or high seismic zone port. And so what you can see is that the blue, as you would expect, most of them, the vast majority of them, had not conducted seismic risk assess assessments. Um, however, that was true also for over 40% of the yellow ports, so which is not what you would want to see. Um, this paper is forthcoming in earthquake spectra. So sometimes there aren't risk assessments. Secondly, even if you do have a risk assessment, some of you have definitely been involved in technical risk assessments, a lot of them, and they pose technical and translation challenge challenges. So it's risk assessment is analytically intensive, it's data intensive, and it requires a number of value judgments that people may not always agree on. Further, in the hazards field in particular, people often use scenario analysis. And so even the worst case scenarios can be insufficient to plan for devastating rare events, as we have seen in some notable cases recently. And those results then can be lost in the translation of the technical terms um, in the case of communicating, for example, the uncertainties or um, some particular technical parameters. So one solution to this might be to engage analysts with the technical analysts with others in facilitated discussions. And we talked about this with the students this afternoon a bit. In order to allow people to probe and ask the questions that they need to and get answered in order to be able to understand what's going on with the risk assessments and what the assumptions are and how they can interpret the conclusions. And you can see on the right here some useful metric conversions for those risk assessments. 
So in the Pacific Northwest, um, John Vidali, um, who graciously helped me with um, prepare this talk, is the director of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and he has already conducted an early, early earthquake um, a warning workshop. And he invited in, um, illustrating the kind of good practice that you want to have with this, 50 plus people from all different sectors, pub public, private, political, and government sectors, to discuss the er early um, earthquake warning system development. And of those who attended, most were ready to do something, um, but that ranged quite a bit. That ranged from just allowing the staff to see the earthquake early morning to actually using it to shut off mechanical systems, for example, or um, protect lifelines, that kind of thing, anything that you could do on a very short-term basis. And they were more interested in learning about what people have done with earthquake early warning systems around the world and what the possibilities are. So they were interested but tentative in their responses to the possibilities. They were also very concerned about the kind of public education program that would be required to have the public make what they called risk-wise decisions. So uh, what, what would be the scope of the public education effort that would be needed, and who should be responsible for it, and above all, who should pay for it? Okay, now I'm going to move to um, Greg's first question about false alarms. Okay, so you can see from this that this weather broadcaster in Boulder, this is in the context of flash floods, is very concerned about losing credibility. I have a higher bar for lighting my hair on fire because I truly believe that most people who are using our service, I don't think they want you to run around with your hair on fire. The bar should be pretty high because there will come a time, it's not if but when, you're going to have to make a warning for a highly populated area. It's going to be a serious, dangerous situation and people need to trust that you're not just yanking their chain again. And I've heard variants on this across a wide range of hazards, but it seems to be in particular those who are issuing the warnings who are most concerned about it. And um, so the question is, what, what happens to people's credibility? And um, as many of you have already anticipated, well, it's not a good thing for your credibility when you issue, issue false alarms. And what can we say about what exactly it does? Well, I'm going to draw on some work, work that was done by Ken Simmons and Sutter um, on tornado warnings and false alarms, because this is one domain in which we have quite a lot of statistics that are pretty well kept. And you can use this simple two by two to illustrate um, what happens with the warnings and false alarms. So you can see in the upper left we have hits, so you forecast it and it happens. Um, and then we have false alarms, you forecast it but it doesn't happen. And then we have misses, you, forget, you fail to forecast it and um, it happens. And then we have correct negatives. So if we think about the learning opportunities, if you have a system of warnings, you want the system to improve over time. If you think about the learning opportunities for these, they are hampered in this situation of risk by a couple of different things. So for example, um, for earthquakes as well as for tornadoes, you can have problems defining what constitutes a hit. Is it something where the epicenter is as close? Does the mag magnitude have to be what you predicted? And for tornadoes, there are lots of issues about the same kind of thing. Which area is it that you're covering? How much of the area has to be covered by the tornado in order for it to be counted as a hit? That kind of thing. Um, so definitions and disagreements and near misses, um, should you count them as hits or not? How do they get count? Um, but there's also the problem that misses can be fatal, as, as we know, especially for earthquakes. Um, but also, the consequences can be sporadic, and particularly with um, risks where there aren't uh, large recurrences, I mean, um, frequent recurrences. You can have a problem that um, people won't learn from the system because the system just doesn't operate very often. So it's, it's problematic. But uh, like I said, in tornadoes, we have a lot of experience with this. And so they calculated the statistics for t um, tornado forecast performance over over uh, the 1987 to 2005 period. And what you see here is, uh, I pulled out the statistics for Kansas, because we all think about tornadoes when we think about Kansas, and for California. And you can see here, this is the probability of detection, right? And so it's x over x plus y. And for Kansas, it's 0 0.65, so that's pretty high. 0.14 for California. And um, this is an average one year uh, false alarm rate. Um, for all states, it's 0.754. For Kansas, it's 0.69, so it's lower. For California, it's 0.85, so it's higher. And why is that? What's the obvious answer? How many tornadoes do you have in California compared to what they have in <laughs> Almost nothing, right? So, so the system can't learn very rapidly. There's not a lot of experience in California. And there are probably also 
um, different meteorological conditions that make it more difficult to, to forecast, I would guess, though I don't know. But this is, these are the statistics from it. And you can see that, that the false alarm ratio is actually quite high, right? So, so does that mean that you shouldn't have a system? Well, no. And in fact, uh, many people regard the, one of the greatest scientific accomplishments of the meteorological community over the last century as improvements in tornado warnings. And um, the value of the Doppler radar, in um, Simmons and Sutter's words, is an optimal warning, reduces fatalities from a tornado by 50%, and injuries 41% relative to no warning. So it's hugely valuable in terms of having the system. And they, um, but they go on to look, try to look at and assess the, what happens with a false alarm um, ratio. So if you have a higher false alarm ratio, do you have um, more fatalities? In, in other words, people discredit the system so, you, so they don't respond to it. And so they calculate a recent local false alarm ratio. They use this as a control variable in, re, in casualty regressions. And they argue that if false alarms reduce warning response, there should be more casualties, all else expected. Uh, equal, excuse me, and they find that a one standard deviation increase in the false alarm ratio increases fatalities by 10% and injuries by 9% with both impacts statistically significant. They try several different definitions of false alarm ratios and they find the same thing. So in other words, yes, there is an effect and it's a sizable effect, but as you can see by the, the size of it, it nowhere near approaches the benefit of the system as a whole. So there is a cost to a false alarm ratio, but it's not sufficient to actually try to dismantle the system. And further, there have been arguments in the community that um, the cry wolf effect, um, as we call the false alarm, um, may be offset by increases in risk awareness. Uh, Simmons and Sutter look only at the effects of false alarm rates and probabilities of detection on fatalities and injuries, not at the effects on beliefs or in attitudes towards warnings. So um, they don't actually examine that in their work. And as I mentioned, many res risk researchers say, think that these concerns about false alarm rates are overblown. And in other more limited analyses, they have not found the size of effects that they found uh, smaller effects or indistinguishable um, effects in, uh, uh, from fa false alarm rates. And Dow and Cutter's work is often, Susan Cutter's work is often cited as an example of thinking that false alarm rates are overblown and the evidence for that. However, um, recent laboratory experiments on weather decisions also find a similar false alarm rate with about the same magnitude. So one standard deviation increase in a false alarm ratio can actually increase um, the um, the fatality, uh, the, 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 the increase the bad aspects of the system. And so if you look at what's happened with tornado warnings in the nation over the time period that uh, Simmons and Sutter looked at, what you can see is that we have gotten much, the blue line at the bottom is the probability of detection, the hit rate, the red line is the false alarm rate and so what you, ratio. And so what you see here is that the hit rate has increased dramatically over this time period and it increased a lot from before that as well. And it's continued to increase. There's a trade-off between, of course, detection and false alarms. And so we've managed this in such a way that we've increased the detection but we've um, and managed to maintain the false alarm rate, but it hasn't dropped. 0.74 is still hovering around 0.74. So yes, there is a false alarm effect. So, you have a system. What can you do with a minute or less? What could you do? You could shut off the gas. You could contact the fire department. You could secure lab equipment. Um, you could turn off computers. These, so these responses come from a survey that was done in a set of surveys that was done in California in the late 90s by James Goltz and his uh, colleagues. And the one that is Richard Allen's favorite, I hear, is stopping surgeries, where he shows a picture of an eye surgery that somebody was telling me today. Um, and if you think about what happens if you start a surgery, um, sometimes that means that you're leaving systems open. And if you knew that something was going to happen, you could postpone or delay the start of the surgery so that you waited until the event passed. So there are a lot of uh, sensitive situations that you could either mechanically or with human decision making control in a minute or less. And if you had more minutes, um, you could do even more. But how would you decide what to do? And what would determine what you would do in particular? 
in any situation that we enter, we go through what's basically an appraisal process. And this is a framework for thinking about um, our assessment of the situation, our appraisal of the situation. The particulars, um, there are variations on among so, uh, social psychologists and psychologists, cognitive psychologists about what exactly is happening. But the general gist of this is pretty much common across the researchers who have looked at it. Um, and we assess first affect, so we have an affective response to the situation pleasantness. Uh, we assess how much effort's involved. Uh, we look at attentional activity or what is, you have to determine a focus basically for any situation. Uh, certainty or uncertainty of the situation. And then people think about whether they themselves or some other person is in control and whether the situation is under the control of people or something else. Um, so those are the basic uh, pieces of the appraisal process. And I'm going to focus in the next session on, on, section of the talk on one of these which is affect. So if, I, know, I don't think any of you have paper with you, but I'd like to go through a little thought experiment with you. And so we'll start with um, this ice cream. How much would you be willing to pay for this delicious vanilla ice cream? Got any bids? One dollar. One dollar. Anybody else? <laughs> no. I guess it's too cold out. <laughs> okay, now pretend you didn't see that. And how much would you be willing to pay for this delicious ice cream? So you guys are too smart. You've probably already figured this out. <laughs> um, so what do you think happens here when I present them side by side? So a series of experiments was run using, this is a between subjects experiment, not within subjects. So if you show people the ice cream separately, then which one do you suppose you get the higher price for? Yeah. L is right. You, L because it's an overfilled container. And so your evaluation of what it's worth is a function of it's the relative amount of ice cream relative to the container, because that's sort of what you've got as a focus. Whereas if you're given, um, and so H gets the less price, the lower price. But if you put them side by side, a certain proportion of subjects will then switch their preferences and give you, uh, they'll switch the one that they pay more for, right? Because they then see that you're getting more ice cream with the 10 ounce cup, um, even though it looks underfilled. So it's how people focus that's determining what's going on and that actually determines their preferences. And this um, affective response um, is discussed ex ex at length by uh, Danny Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It comes from system one, which is a very fast, rapid system. And we can think about this in a risk context as an affect heuristic uh, or risk as feelings, where a heuristic is a rule of thumb or mental shortcut in terms of how we evaluate the system. So affect means the specific quality of goodness or badness of the situation. It's experienced as a feeling state, so it can be with or without consciousness, and it demarcates a positive or negative quality of the stimulus. Um, and they, the, the particular thing about these is that they're in the syst what Danny Kahneman calls system, system one. They occur rapidly and automatically as part of the appraisal process. However, so this is a great process. It helps us, it enables us to respond really rapidly. However, it's sometimes misleading. Um, it makes you subject to manipulation. Uh, for example, when attractive names and images are used, like clean coal <laughs> um, or background music, music, all you have to do is think about movies and it's the music that cues you um, with what affective response you're supposed to have to the movie. Affective tags can be used and there are experiential shortcomings as well. So for example, psychophysical numbing. If many people, there's a well-known effect called the victim, identifiable victim effect where people are often willing to pay more to help a specific identifiable person than they are to help 10 people who may be at, in harm's way. So we, um, once we ex get too many people involved or too many things involved, we can be ex psychophysically numbed and we don't have an affective response anymore. It can also be difficult to anticipate or recall visceral um, factors. So people may not remember how hard it was to walk across campus. They may not remember how hot it was when they tried to walk across campus in the summer. And they may actually um, forget about certain pain factors or um, pleasure factors in terms of visceral factors. And then there's construal, which is um, a construct that has to do with how close something feels or how far away it feels. So you can have psychological distance, which means that um, Something will seem very near or very far away, 
um, and you can have temporal control, which is it seems like it's going to be right now versus it seems like it's far in the distance. And um, the more psychologically proximate something is, the, the more concretely we th tend to think about it, whereas the more psychologically distant is, the more abstractly we tend to think about it. So, so there are lots of ways in which this affect heuristic can be changed. So I'm going to try to bring this home with another pricing example. And you can see here um, on your left is Melissa Finucane, and this is Paul Slovic, who out of Decision Research when they were doing this research. And um, uh, they did a series of gambles building on work that Amos Tversky, among others, had done earlier. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the gambling uh, paradigm for doing research on risk. And what they did here is they offered people a gamble um, some people got 29, 36 po a chance of winning two dollars, and they asked them either to give a price, how much they'd be willing to pay for that gamble, or to give it an affectiveness rating. So people didn't get the same the same task. And what you can see here is, um, and the second line is the other gamble that other students were given, which is a 736 chance to win nine dollars, and um, the price that some of them gave, and the mean attractiveness rating that some of them gave. So what's interesting here is that the willingness to pay for the gamble um, is higher for the $9 gamble with the low probability. And the mean attractiveness rating is higher for the $2 gamble with the higher probability. So this comes back to evaluability again. And um, you can see the effects of that in particular when you add in another experiment they did to try to then test their hypothesis that has, this had to do with what aspect of the characterization of the gamble people were focusing on. So it's this evaluability hypothesis again. So they added a potential loss of five cents here um, to the second uh, gamble, the nine dollar gamble. And so this time they gave people a choice. They could either gamble or uh, choose two dollars for sure, and that's in this column here. Um, and then in this one, they ask for the mean attractiveness rating. So once again, it's between subjects. So what you can see here is for the 736 chance to win $9, that gets a 9.4 rating. And it's either $9 or nothing, right? So you play the gamble, or, um, and, and, and that's what your rating here is, 9.4. When you add the possibility of losing a loss, loss, which will then decrease the expected value of the gamble, right? The attractiveness rating goes up. So these aren't the same subjects, but it goes up to 14.9. So this has so adding a loss increases the rated attractiveness of the gamble, which is quite counterintuitive. So what the what goes on here? To, so you can see that this reflected in the choice of the two dollars for sure option for those who had that. So some people were asked to make choices, and they could choose the two dollars for sure versus take the gamble. And in this context here, 33 percent chant chose the gamble over the two dollar gain. In this context, 61 percent chose the gamble over the two dollar gain. So the choices were consistent with the attractiveness ratings. And their explanation here is the judgment is dominated by the probability in this case, which has a more precise meaning than the context-free dollar amount. But adding the loss brings the dollar amount into focus. People are then suddenly thinking about the money, and so it brings the $9 gain into focus and gives it meaning. So it's a very um, elegant set of experiments to show this. So the explanations. It, it's the ease of mapping the stimulus onto the response scale that determines the evaluation. It's the compatibility between the stimulus and the response. The more precise the affective impression, the greater the influence on judgment and decision making. And affect bestows meaning on the information specifically. So how does this pertain then to earthquake early warning? Well, when consequences have strong affect affective meaning, people tend to be relatively insensitive to the probabilities of those consequences. And for all of you who are so focused on probabilities, they're just out the window for a lot of people as soon as they start thinking about the consequences. OK, so they titled their paper um, discussing these effects, Rational Actors or Rational Fools, because affect lubricates reason and enables rational action, but it also depends on co context and experience, and it enables manipulation. So you have to think consciously about how you're framing the information in these contexts. So I'm going to talk about one, now I've, we've gone through affect, and I'm going to talk about what Danny Kahneman calls system two, but just one aspect of it, which is cognition um, about numbers. And we were just talking about probability. How do people understand probabilities? So which is larger? As for all of you, this is easy, <laughs> but Ellen Peters and others have found that about 10% of respondents have trouble with this kind of comparison. So it's pretty high. And in a series of experience, experiments by Coote, uh, Neil Weinstein, and others, uh, they looked at a number of different tasks with probabilities. 
And um, we're looking in particular at the inability to understand numbers. For example, knowing which risk is larger, 1%, 5%, or 10%. So what you can see here is we have um, three different formats for probabilities, percent, frequency, and one in N. And um, these are the different tasks that they were given. And these are the percentage of correct answers. So clearly, what's the most obvious thing about this graph? Well, for me, the most obvious thing is that, first of all, people's ability to understand the numbers um, differs by format depending on the context. So the same format may not be equally effective in all contexts, but most salient is that it never goes above about 80%. So there are a lot of people who cannot do very well, do tasks very well that involve numbers. They have problems with them. And when you look at adding, um, here percentages are by far the easiest to add here. One and in just doesn't work at all. And we're down to like, you know, the 10% here getting it right. So it's a problem. And, um, and so this paper is a very nice summary of a lot of research. They have a very um, pretty large sample, and it's, it's, it's pretty compelling research. So you have to think about that. Now, another aspect of this came up in the discussion this afternoon, um, and that's verbal probability. So some people think, well, OK, so numbers are a big problem. Why don't we just give people words instead? and we'll solve this problem with the numbers. And the problem is that giving the words instead may or may not work. So the IPCC, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has tried to get around this by promoting this little um, table that translates verbal probabilities into likelihood of occurrence. And um, they used this in the previous round, and they're uh, apparently using it now as well. And so you can see that they use phrases that they assign specific likelihood ranges to, ranging from virtually certain, which is greater than 99%, down to exceptionally unlikely, less than 1%. Um, and I'm going to talk about some results from research by David Badescu and his colleagues. They have a paper in Psychological Science in 2009, but they have a couple other papers since then, too, that talk about the same kind of thing and find very consistent results. So this is a summary of their results. And it's going to take a second to explain it here. Um, so on the left, the, the central nine, this shows the central 90% of the distributions of their best estimates of the meanings of four probability terms. Very likely, unlikely, likely, and very likely. And, when the, and so it's under a couple different conditions. And what you can focus on here is this is the control condition. So this is the condition here where um, they're given what the IPCC prints, basically. Um, so that means that they get verbal probabilities in the verbal probability statements in the summary of the text. Um, in this context, this is the manipulation that David did where he added the numbers in. Um, so it's verbal numerical groups. They get both the words and they get the probabilities numerically. And um, what you can see here is uh, this is this box is the 50 percent. So these are two key box, box plots. The box is 50 percent of the distribution, and the line is the median estimate. And this number here is the percentage of those who got the, the who basically said the, gave an interpretation that was inconsistent with what the IPCC intended. So in other words, it's wrong, right? So they got the wrong meaning out of the verbal probability phrase. And so what's really salient here is that it's if you average across these, it's um, the majority get it wrong with just the words. And especially in these extreme conditions where you might be particularly concerned about their understanding things correctly. Um, so here it's like 73% and here it's 67%. So when you add the numbers, does it help? And the answer is yes, it helps. Uh, six, it, this goes from 73 to 60%, and this goes from 67 to 53%, and these go about 10% lower too. So what happens, what you can see here is we have these medians going down for the lower end, and going up for the higher end. And so we're decompressing the estimates some. And compression is something that you often see in subjective estimates of probability, where people tend to overestimate low probabilities and underestimate high probabilities. So his, his uh, results show quite clearly that giving the numbers, even though it adds to the amount of information and makes it more complex, actually helps people understand the information better. Um, but did the IPCC take this into account in their most recent summary for poly policymakers? No, not that I can tell. <laughs> Okay, so there's numbers. So what about the uh, visuals in the early earthquake warning that, um, that we saw? What can we say about those? And there are a couple different things that we can say about perceptual primitives, for example, and interpreting maps. Wolf and Horowitz at, um, I believe they're at Harvard, 
um, have done a, a couple of reviews. They have a very nice set of reviews of research on this topic over many decades, looking at perceptual primitives. And they find that, in fact, the things that determine our attention um, are color, motion, size, and orientation in that order. So color is most important, motion second, and size is third. And we also know from research on visuals in risk contexts that there is a risk hierarchy for color. Red's riskier than yellow, yellow's riskier than green. And there are uh, many different experiments on this. And I almost always get asked, so I'm going to anticipate it, whether this holds across culture. And there's a recent study that shows that, in fact, in comparing industrial managers in China to their, um, their uh, colleagues in the United States in similar positions, the, this risk hierarchy is even stronger there than it is here. So yes, it holds cross-culturally generally. So we, have, we know that there are these perceptual primitives, and in fact, you, if you think about it, we'll go back to the early warning in a minute, they're used in the display. Um, whether or not it's effective, I don't know, but <laughs> we'll see. Further, um, there is something that you might call an image to graphic continuum in visuals, and um, this is taken from McKickrin and Gantner's work. But we can also think about this as going from a depiction, which is something like a picture of something, right? So it depicts the situation and the relations between the objects in the, in the image match what you would perceive in the real object. So this is a picture here, basically. I guess I should use this slide occasionally. Um, this is a picture. Um, but you can see this gets increasingly abstract. So descriptions are generally, um, they don't have the same kind of correspondence as depictions does. And these kinds of, this kinds of um, information is not all processed the same. And I'm going to show you a couple more examples of this increasing abstraction. This is from NASA, um, work by the Goddard Sky Space Flight Center and uh, USGS and many others. And you can see that this gets more abstract showing cultivated systems. This is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Um, and this gets even more abstract where we're showing an abstract graphic showing habitat loss in a number of different biomes um, to the 1990s. And people process this kind of an information um, very differently depending on how abstract it is. So the depiction end is pro processed pretty much like the same way that you would perceive something in reality, whereas the description is, is processed quite differently using different parts of the brain. brain. Both uh, percepts and mental images activate the visual cortex, but mental, mental images are organized depiction, depiction and they, um, they correspond directly to percepts, but that's not true for descriptions. Okay. So there has also been um, a, a number of studies, quite a lot of studies, by Barbara Tversky when she was here at Stanford, actually. And I guess she's not here very much. But she still has an affiliation on map perceptions. Did any of you participate in these? She used maps of Stanford for some of these experiments. They're kind of fun. No, OK. Well, anyway, she found that people have systematic errors in memory and judgment. And so th these suggest that people take a pers pers specific perspective on maps. Um, and cognitive maps are more like collages. People construct a spatial framework from the extensions of their body axes. So the accessibility of the information depends on asymmetries of the body as well as of the world. And in particular, head to feet is fastest. So that's up and down. That's a, that we process that fastest. Front and back is next, and then left to right is slowest. If you think about distinguishing left to right, it's much harder than up to down. And um, so we, in some sense, embody cognition. And people can adopt both outside or inside views on maps. And they promote different um, perspectives. So viewing something from outside versus viewing the surrounding environment from inside these different parts of the brain. And when we have an outside view on something, we tend to see it as something that we can manipulate, whereas an inside view tends to be associated with motion, so sort of doing something yourself um, rather than manipulating something from the outside. And this I illustrate with the graphic that's on the poster. Um, this is work that I did with Olske Samanchi and many others um, at George Tech when I was there. Um, and th these are two cartoons that she drew to illustrate visual strategies that we identified in a survey of popular earthquake uh, films. And so on the top, is um, these are helicopter blades. And this is moving over an area where there have been a lot of deaths or mortalities. And so this is a bird's eye view or a map view. So that promotes an outsider perspective on the risk. And this to the right is a narrative strategy. So somebody's fleeing to safety across safer zone, zone, so they're jumping. It's action. So this illustrates the kind of difference that you can get in different, uh, different depictions or descriptions of what's going on. And these are both um, what you would call more on the descriptive ends of, end of things. Further, in this area of research, 
Um, people argue that you pro might want to distinguish between spatial and visual imagery. This is particularly important in a, in a domain like earthquake engineering where there's a lot of spatial imagery, right? So um, it can, they've found that visual imagery can impede reasoning, whereas spatial imagery can facilitate reasoning in many, many contexts. So you have to think carefully about how you're using it. Okay, so now we're at the point where we can revisit this and hopefully you have a new perspective on it. Earthquake, no shaking expected in 19 seconds. Earthquake, no shaking expected in 12 seconds. Earthquake, no shaking expected in 5 seconds. Okay. Did anything change? Hopefully. You can see a, a use of a lot of the different aspects of um, presentation and visualization that we've discussed. You can see the use of numbers, the use of colors, spatial. There's a, a lot of these uh, different elements, and it's not clear that they're being used to their best advantage, put it that way. Okay, so in sum, risk perception is lay risk assessment without formal decomposition into probability and harm. It's subject to probability neglect, and subjective probabilities tend to be compressed. It starts with appraisal. It's affective, cognitive, and something that I didn't talk about today much is it's also social. So the affect heuristic is used to evaluate both risks and benefits. Information processing and attention and memory constraints determine how people understand the information that's presented to them, and there are these social and cultural differences. Risk attitudes and behaviors depend on perceived threat, but they also depend on perceived efficacy. Will it harm me and can I do something about it? Can I reduce my risk? And in my own work, um, I look at how people assess and address um, risk perceptions using what I call a mental models approach. So we look at how people understand hazardous processes, um, exposure effects and mitigation. Um, I use decision analysis as a general normative framework for how I think about the situation. And then we do semi-structured interviews and surveys, so ethnographic and survey methodological work, and compare in an open comparison with the decision model to see what people add to the model or what they don't have in the model, for example. And we find also that people often think about unfamiliar risks or unfamiliar risk situations by analogy with other risks. So um, this can be very simple, so they may think that the next earthquake is gonna be like the last one, and that can be extremely problematic. Um, or they may think that something like lead is like mercury. I don't know what happens, is it like mercury where it's there forever? And we found a lot of comparisons like this in our interviews of parents um, about lead paint risks. We have a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences um, that came out recently describing this general approach. And so to um, conclude, like tsunamis, one can think of earthquake early warning as an integral part of a social, physical, and natural system that spans several time scales. Engage people early, and they will be more likely to act appropriately when it matters. Um, and in our own work, we are looking at warnings as part of a system perspective. So here's our system for earthquake early warnings. And um, we think about the short, medium, intermediate, long-term, and then uh, system shifts in the M9 project at the Uni University of Washington, where M stands for magnitude. And I don't know if this is good or bad, but as a placeholder, uh, John Vidali is, um, is, they just launched on Friday the desktop version of the earthquake early warning system, which they're trying to get to work now. And as a placeholder for the, the interface they're using, basically what Richard Allen's group came up with. So we have a long ways to go. Uh, next steps for earthquake early warning. There is a lot of things that can be done to improve earthquake early warning, including seismic and geodetic detection methodological advances, real-time assessment of large magnitude earthquakes during rupture, better statistics for earthquake recurrence and variability of the rupture mode, ground motion prediction, and for the above to make an optimal difference, we need to expand public engagement and behavioral decision and communication research for example, doing survey research on earthquake early warning expectations and implementation, which I will be working on with John Vidali and others in the near future, and uh, testing earthquake early warning and shakeout, which I understand is underway, or at least Lucy said that people are thinking about it, and Lucy Jones, and also earthquake early warning message usability testing, which I know they've done some of in the Berkeley area already and are continuing to do. So lots of work to do, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm looking forward to questions.
of Bostrom field some questions, but I want to especially encourage the students to ask a few questions to get us started and let the, uh, the more elder of us in the crowd uh, have, have the students have some time to get started. Don't all jump up at once. Yes? Maybe, yeah. um, in the study where you mm. showed uh, mm. how the words were related, diabetes CC, what the words they came out with, what were the people responding with? Were they responding with what numbers they got the words? With? Yes, That's okay. the, they're giving uh, their own estimates. Do you think that the act, if you were to ask what the actions of those people would be, the action mm. would be similar because the person who thinks that very likely means 80%, if you showed them the number 80 percent, they would have the same response yeah. versus if a person who thinks very likely is 90 percent, if you show them 90 percent, it would be the same response. So it doesn't matter if what they think attitude the words, what number they attribute to those particular words, their responses would be similar if they, would, if they were given the same words versus the same number. That's a really interesting hypothesis. For the IPCC report, I think that would be very difficult to determine because a lot of the actions that are recommended are actually societal. So um, you might be able to look at that by asking um, them to su support different actions and looking and see if that corresponds. I can't think of any specific experiments that have been done to look at this to control for that. Um, however, I do know that the, the interpretation of a probability does depend on the context. What's, what's true here is that the context is similar across all of the subjects. So in theory, you would think that they would have similar kinds of responses. I just don't know um, if what you're saying is a possibility. It's, it's, I can't rule it out, put it that way. So, yes, Andrew. I have a question Murder. regarding, I'm not a student, <laughs> <laughs> So just pressing question on, on related to this is, is just the number of categories when we divide this, this risk communication. And mm -hmm. something that comes to mind is in somewhere that used to work, uh, they would sort of look at volcano risk and there was a volcano in Mexico City and there was a, a like traffic light kind of thing. There yes. was endless debate whether there would be like the green, yellow, or red, or there would be intermediate colors in that. And uh, I would really appreciate your comments on you know, whether you give them what is the level of this volcano. It's five categories, or three categories, or six. So, so that, that's a really great question. Um, I was in a debate in um, a, the committee that I mentioned earlier on enhancing food safety, where we had, we looked at a number of studies that have been done in England, they had promoted the use of a, a red light, a traffic light system on um, food safety and other kinds of food labeling. And um, in the nutrition context, they actually used a traffic light system to look at how nutritious the food was for you. So they read yellow and green. And they argued that that was all the attention people had. So, and it was, it's, it's a familiar analogy, so you just want to use the simplest possible system um, with three different levels. What comes to mind immediately is work by John Kosnick, who's here and others, where we look at survey responses and the extent to which having more or fewer response categories makes a difference. And so they find that the optimal number of response categories is between five and seven. So that would suggest that um, people can distinguish between more than three levels, and it might be useful to have as many as five, right? But you, we don't have a societal analogy that says, as, um, as strong as we do with the traffic light system. So I, um, so on balance, you'd have to test this, but I would argue that it probably wouldn't be so useful. And one of the things that has been found is that the Homeland Security system, which I think had five levels, right? Um, and it was always orange, <laughs> as far as I could tell. Um, it's been widely shown that that's a pretty useless system. Um, among, well, first of all, nothing ever changed, so it didn't distinguish enough. And second of all, what could you do about it? The system, the warning system didn't really tell you what to do. I mean, there was, it wasn't associated with any specific actions for people who heard these announcements and things. So be more aware, <laughs> whatever. So, so that argues that the information, um, the added information didn't make any difference. In fact, it's only whether or not you can tell people what to do um, that is associated with the number, of whether or not you should have more discrimination between the categories. And the nice thing about the red light, yellow light, green light is that they're associated with actions, right? So um, red means stop, green means go, and yellow means you know caution, or you maybe should think about not doing anything, right? So, so uh, we're taking some precautions. So I don't. Um, so you'd have to test it. I don't know. I think David Deska would say you want to give them the numbers, which is way more discrimination than you get with the red light green light and um, uh, yellow light. And, and so with the volcano system, 
he'd say, okay, so it's so fine with me if you use three, fine with me if you use five, but you should put the numbers in there too. So that's a non-answer. Thank you very much for the talk. I think it's You're welcome. Great research. So when I think about um, early warning in the context of California, obviously the short time scales are a huge problem. So I was wondering how much of this is really a communication challenge because if I only have 20 seconds, I probably need 10 seconds to even think about the warning, what I want to do, and then I probably need 10 seconds to get it out to people. So do we not need a lot of automated, automated response to that? So say yeah. stopping a surgery, my guess would be that that takes at least 50 minutes, even in the best organized hospital, which is far from what we have. So how much of that needs to be automated? And is that in, in itself a communication challenge to say, to say, you know, oh, we're just going to shut off your gas if we think there might be an earthquake coming in. There are obviously like costs and disadvantages associated with that. Right. And that, that alone might be a lot of pushback. So I was wondering what you could comment yeah. on the automation um, side of this. Well, that's outside of my field of research, but the responses that we got from the workshop suggest that you're absolutely right, that people were um, quite hesitant about it, saying that their organizations would go ahead and use automated systems immediately, even though when you look at what's happened with earthquake early warning in other countries, like Japan, for example, it's automated system shutoff that's proved the most valuable, I think. Um, we, I couldn't find, and my colleagues um, didn't find an immediate assessment of the relative benefits for automated versus other responses. But it's clear that um, they, systems designers see the automated responses as the potentially most valuable. It's kind of confounded though, because I know John Vidali, who's a PI, he's, they're looking for funding too. So they're really interested in talking with big organizations that have big systems that might be damaged by an earthquake that, could, that they could have automated systems on that would then protect in the case of an, uh, an earthquake, um, partially because they can get funding from those organizations. So he's actually, um, I don't think this is private knowledge, but he's been talking with Mauna Loa about their telescopes because they had a lot of damage from an earthquake a while ago, millions of dollars worth of damage, and with an automated early warning um, shut off, they could have protected the telescope and had no damage. So it, the system would have paid for itself immediately in the case of a single event. So yes, um, there is a communications challenge clearly because the organizations in Seattle did not immediately buy into this. <laughs> they're, they're like, okay, we want to see what other people are doing, we've got to think about this. And um, my guess is that with further discussions, some organizations will immediately see the benefit of automated shutoff systems. And BP, as in particular, showed some interest. Shown some, some interest. They have a lot of operations, refinery operations, and things where they may be potentially interested in automated systems. But, um, but even in the case of surgery, there are certain things that you can do on the order of 10 seconds, personally. You can, hold off from cutting into somebody's eye. That doesn't take more than 10 seconds. And if you think about your own behavior, or at least I think about my own behavior, there's some systems to which, um, sounds to which I have an automatic response. So I hear the alarm, I jump up out of bed. And so that comes with preconditioning. <laughs> okay, you guys don't, but I <laughs> Some people don't, some people do. Actually, I heard that graduate students don't jump out of bed here. But, uh, <laughs> but um, they sleep till noon, that's what Jack said. Um, you guys can discuss this with him afterwards. Um, yeah, so, so, so um, working with communities to discuss the possibilities and to give people an understanding of the response options in advance and so that this, the warning system is part of their understanding of, the, of what's going on. It's going to change the responsiveness and their ability to respond. Um, if you have set um, actions that you know you want to take on the case of hearing a specific warning or seeing a specific warning, it doesn't take more than a few seconds. So the appraisal process, as I mentioned, is just milliseconds. And once you've figured out that this is the alarm that you've seen examples of and you know what you're supposed to do, you can get under a chair, for example, or under a table. So, very good question. Um, how about back here? Um, I was just going to say, I'm, uh, I work at the Berkeley Seismic Lab for Richard Allen, and oh. I'm working with John Vidali on this as well. All these, um, so my area of expertise is this sort of like intersection between what these companies are Sounds great. Do you have anything to add to that last question? Oh, the, the, the surgery, I mean, you, you, you said the, the first obvious thing is lifting the scalpel from the eye. Uh, obviously, you're talking about tiny automated things, just um, warning and, and 
for hospitals or for other big things, or, or you can issue a bed count for like oh. mass casualty incidents within about 10 seconds. And you can also uh, remove tubes from, um, what do you call it, uh, anesthesiology. Uh -huh. Because it's easier to unplug something for 20 seconds and plug it back in than the risk of force of extubation during surgery. So Creepy. Little tiny thing that, you know, it's certainly not like stopping prepping a whole surgery thing like that. Like, yeah. You know, that takes at least 15 minutes. So, it's yeah. Like a little tiny. Excellent. And the Japanese, um, what they talk about mostly is uh, train systems. They're bullet trains and stuff. So if you can slow down the train even, and even they recommend that if people are dry, driving, that if they can't stop, they at least slow down. So you just lift your pedal, your foot off the gas pedal or something. So who's next? How about you? So related to false predictions, why don't people address earthquake and other hazard warnings the same way they do Pascal, hopefully facetious wager? Where, okay, well, we don't, we don't really have any evidence of this. We don't know if it's going to happen or not, but just in case, we better hedge our bets and duck under our desks. Oh, well, people do, actually. So, I'm sorry, what do you so mean? So why do we worry about the threshold being too low for uh, giving them the warning? Oh, oh, um, well... You tell me. No, no I, I think there are concerns about um, the costs of automated system response, for example. So we, you know, it's, it can be extremely expensive to do major system shutdown um, without any necessity for it. So there are things like that that people are quite concerned about and liability for that. More it, expensive than having your quick happen and shut anything down? No, but that's not the counterfactual they're thinking of. <laughs> So they're thinking of, oh, we just went along our way and kept on um, operating and made some more money. I'm, I'm being facetious, but no, that is not, that is exactly the issue. That's not the counterfactual they're thinking of. So, um, and in any kind of trade-off situation, you have to think about what the counterfactual is that people are um, comparing, because their assessments of the situation, as we illustrated earlier with the ice cream cups, um, depends on the counterfactual or the, the comparative that they're focusing on. Yes, no? Yes. And very fascinating work Thank you. on information processing, information uh, perception. Uh, I have th three observations. One is, even if this works perfectly, let's say it works perfectly, are you familiar with the case in Italy three years ago? I am. <laughs> and, uh, I think like all public policy issues, that may trump science, I think. Uh, that's one observation. And if the students don't know, maybe you can comment on that. Second observation I have is the contextual. This is wonderful for California. Or countries like Japan, where there is a huge network of inf information available. Most of the people die, or the, some of the largest economic losses occur, are in emerging economies. Yeah. China, India, Southeast Asia. There is no network. Or if there is any, it's very minimal. So even if this works perfectly, because of our knowledge of, of human brain processes, understands, and so on. As a public policy issue, implementing it is a problem. Yes. And third uh, observation I have, these are all observations. Uh, when you go to a country where people ride on top of a train going at 60 miles per hour, <laughs> their perception of risk it's quite different than what you and I made we be thinking. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for your observations. And I'd like to comment on each one of them. So the Laquilla earthquake um, case, many of you may be familiar with, um, where well, it's kind of a complex case, but I, we ran this as a, as a case, um, a mock trial in my risk communication class on climate change. <laughs> Um, just because I thought it was such a great example of the problems with communicating uncertainty. And um, there's a, there was a lot of other things going on there. There's a lot of um, political maneuvering and um, science. Uh, it was not the ideal court for science, put it that way. I so, agree. People so, sat there for a few hours <laughs> just on the 
So. Definitely. And we spent several weeks on it in my class. It was, a, it was a great example for the students to explore. And it, it's true that in any situation where you have science interacting with policy, policy and politics are going to trump science um, a lot of the time. So that's just something you have to deal with. And one of the issues, our scientists often think, OK, we just need better scientific literacy, and this won't happen. And evidence from the social sciences suggests that that's not true. <laughs> it will happen anyway. So it, that people need to be aware of that and understand the implications of that for the practice of science, even the science of communications. In the second case, emerging countries, I'm a technological optimist, and I, I bet at heart you are too. And so there are a lot of emerging systems for sensing with cheaper um, technologies, and technology is advancing very rapidly. So I would argue that probably within the next decade, we may have um, a cheaper and better um, system of detecting P waves and S waves than we do now that may be deployed at lower cost and faster. So I don't know if that's true, but I'm an optimist. So um, cell phones, for example. And cell phones are extremely widely used in developing countries, as you know. Um, on the third point, which is um, people's understanding, is that, uh, now I'm forgetting the third point, that people will have different tolerances for risk. And uh, that definitely is true. And some people would chalk it up to adolescence. And there's a lot of research on the difference, differences between adolescents and others, or the similarities between adolescents and others, and how they process risk information. Um, there's disagreement about that in the field. So I can't say one thing or the other. But I'm still horrified when I hear about this train writing stuff. Um, but it's very clear that people have different goals when they enter risk situations. So some people may be most worried about protecting their costs and keeping low costs. And other people may have a very high tolerance for wide variability in cost and may be really interested in just making sure that some particular set of people are not harmed. So very different goals. And that comes out as, as a sort of a difference in risk tolerance. And so that's why we have such wide ranging debates in society about what's acceptable risk. Because we don't all accept the same risks. So thank you for your observations. Yes. I think of the 30 seconds or 40 seconds you get, that gives you enough time to put the children on the seat. You know, they can go under the table, go in the corner. They can stay away from the objects which are sliding or falling away. Yes. So that is enough time to save the life or all the dangers you know coming from falling objects. Other thing is, I don't know if you agree or not. Like in India and other countries, I understand that the animals have a much better feeling of an incoming earthquake. They start running, you can observe their actions, and maybe you can experiment with, you know, side by side this, you compare it when your alarm goes on, that do the animals start moving or they react differently, just a suggestion. Yeah. Well, that's outside my field of research, but it sounds like a fun idea. I have to, I have to admit that um, I read a lot about this a long time ago when I was still a poetry student. And I wrote a poem about ants in Mount Merapi. <laughs> anyway, so I think it's a great suggestion for someone. Thank you. Yes. That was Sarah, you've been. So this, this might not be a fair question, but you know, you showed us at the end the um, the new system that was doing the, that one. Yeah, you want to see and that. And you seemed a little critical. So I'm just curious, how would you modify this? What would be your recommendations to modify this for better risk communication? That's a really good question. So um, what would you guys say after the talk? What's the first thing that strikes you? Complexity. Yes, complexity. There's way too much information on it if you think that it's going to be unfamiliar to people. So people have a very high level of tolerance for information with which they're information and um, with, with which they're familiar. And so I showed this to a geologist, and um, not this one, but um, it was the map view stuff. And so the, the general feeling is that if you want to get people to do something, Having the hypothesis going in is that taking an inside view on the map is really important because then you can get m motivate action more readily. Whereas if you have a map view, this is a map view, for example, mm -hmm. then people see it as an object that's outside of sort of the action realm, and so it's going to promote a different kind of affective response and different uh, um, appraisal of the situation. 
But the geologist who was, I was talking to is like, I, I love maps. I, I prefer map views over all other views, and it would definitely be easier for me to process the map view. So yeah, I don't know. So, so there are definitely different tolerances for different types of information depending on people's training. But if we're sort of thinking about people's gut reactions to an unfamiliar piece of information, um, it may differ depending on that kind of thing. The, the, com the complexity in this uh, display is really overwhelming unless you're very familiar with it. Um, and there's still, you look at it and there's like probability of correct ho alarm high. So why did they put that in there? It's probably, you know, they're protecting their butts. I'm um, excuse my language, but you no, know, so, so they're trying to convey sort of the credibility of the system because they're concerned about that, but that's not going to be what somebody's going to react to when they have 10 seconds. I mean, it's going to take, to process all the information on this thing would probably take you on the order of a minute or two at least if you were. Um, and then on the, other, the other thing is they're using um, this, these numbers. So I was thinking about this um, on the way down here. Um, they have moderate shaking expected. Um, so first of all, you have all different colors there, but generally it's kind of yellow for moderate shaking. Well, moderate shaking for a seismologist is like pretty serious for somebody who's never been in an earthquake before. So moderate shaking, what does that mean to somebody? And would they actually expect what's going to happen? My guess is not. They would be like, oh, this is way worse than I expected. They said moderate shaking, right? So, so there are a lot of things about this that they, that they probably should test. But, and then they've got the numbers here, but they've got time and magnitude and expected intensity with this sort of scale that you're supposed to quickly scan and understand. So you'd have to understand the scale. This goes back to the categorization question that Eduardo asked. They've got a, um, the whole 10-point scale here in Roman numerals. So, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> we could just go on and on. So, yes. Yes, sir. That was actually my question, one of my questions. But I'll just have two small follow-ons to that. So one is the you would propose then that it would be better to have one of those maps where you feel like you're inside. Is that based on the research that like you showed those yeah. maps? Did, did people respond more well, no, appropriately for the risk when no, it was... Yeah, no, we didn't get to, t so we tried to test this actually with some hazardous map information and we were supposed to be working with the people who were doing um, virtual earthquake shaking in uh, Illinois, but it didn't, it didn't work out. So we didn't get access to the inside perspective view on it. So then we tried doing some slight variants, variants on that. We did find, um, we did find some statistically significant differences in different types of, of information that promote um, it was on this depiction to description continuum. It wasn't really the inside outside view, unfortunately. So I haven't actually had a chance to test that. And I don't know of anybody who has tested it. Um, I think it's worth feeling because there's a, everybody has a strong intuition that an inside point of view would promote a sort of a more rapid sort of affective reaction. Yeah. And then the other question just about the scale, like you mentioned that there was research that something between five and seven is what people would. For numbers of categories. Numbers of categories. Yeah. yeah. But wouldn't there be a pretty big difference between, or would there be a pretty big difference between an odd or an even number? Because with the even, you don't have a middle. Oh so yeah. Like be more complacent. I mean, right. Does that matter? Well, for survey methodologists, it matters. They don't. They, um, if they're trying to get a, um, opinions on preferences, so a lot of this is from political polling work, and they don't really want to people to give them a middle option. So they use even number of scales where they have to force people one side of the scale or the other. But for somebody like me, I'm interested in understanding and communication of uncertainty, so I want to know if they choose the middle response. And I know from uh, quite a bit of research I've done where I include the middle response, a lot of people don't know or they feel like they're right in the middle. They're not sure if it's yes or no, it's bad or, or good, and they really don't know and they want more information about it. And people are quite sensitive to the level of knowledge that they have, so they don't like to claim they know more than they do. Um, and you don't get that if you force them one side or the other. Um, but but in, this, in terms of this, I don't think people would have, uh, I don't think they'd even have ta a chance to think about how many categories there are. They'd be responding to the color first, because that's the first perceptual primitive there. So thank you. Two more questions? Maybe there are two students here over on the right. Uh, so my question is, there's a lot of information, like you said, on the, on the slide of the program. Why doesn't it just give you the amount of time and what we should do? I feel like that's a lot easier. Yeah, so it does give you the amount of time. So that's this remaining time is the time till shaking is expected. Um, or until no, sh no shaking is expected, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it does, it, so, um, and the prob what it, so one of the reasons, there are a couple reasons why it might not give you what to do. Um, so when, some ideas, I see some people nodding. Well, who are the users? 
So we already talked about these kinds, this kind of a warning system being used for a very wide range of users in people in all different kinds of circumstances. And in order to tell people what to do, you need to know their situation. So this, is, this would be the absolutely best situation where you could have an app that people would use that would be sensitive to the context that they were in. And so like somebody has their cell phone and has an app on it, it gives them a warning, and it knows that they're in their house and it says, get underneath that table. <laughs> you know, that would work probably. But um, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> so, yeah. One more. Um, I have a question about what you would consider the ideal form of, the, of like a mass warning system, whether it be a, a smartphone app or like a TV interruption or radio. Because um, I was wondering if there's like any research into how people would respond mm -hmm. if they get the warning individually or if they hear the warning as a group of people. I was wondering if there's any, if you know any yeah. cases or if there's any research about how groups of people respond, whether they get the yeah, there's actually quite a bit of research going on in this domain now because of the sort of advance of social media. Um, and it's not my, I don't work on social media directly. I do work with Kate Starbury at the University of Washington who does social media analyses. And um, so that's changing very rapidly. There were some surveys post, Tohoku, um, the, post the um, Great Eastern Japan earthquake and in Tokyo there were some surveys um, in the after aftershocks and things. It's, I'm going to get this wrong, but anyway, they, it was a private firm apparently that did a number of surveys. And what they found is that, in fact, um, one of the things they found is that people who were aware of a lot more people were aware of the earthquake early warning system than they thought would be aware of it, compared to what they found in previous research um, a few years before that. Um, and they found that people valued the cell phone information, those people had it. I believe, and I should have written the numbers down, I believe that it was still more people who said that it was valuable to have it on um, an email system than on um, their cell phone, which kind of surprised me, but you have to sort of think about where they are with the technology use. Um, and they still valued TV and radio. Generally from communications, risk communication work, you know that you have to have uh, several different um, channels for the information to go out, and the information needs to be consistent across the channels. So it's really important to use as many different avenues as you can. And Japan has definitely taken that to heart. They broadcast stuff on radio, TV, social media, cell phones, you name it. So. Great. Great. Well, you obviously uh, Thank you. got everybody's attention, and hopefully we all leave with a few actionable items uh, moving forward in our lives and our research. Thank you very Sounds much for a fascinating time. Thank you very much. Thank you.